Good evening. Brenda. Hey, sis. How are you? I'm sorry, I missed that. I said, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good, good. How's the family? Everybody seems to be doing well. Good. Glad to hear it. How's your family? Everybody's well. Mike's having a few issues, but he's he's come along pretty good. He's had a few setbacks, but... um. He's under doctor's care right now, so let's keep him in your prayers. God bless you, Facebook Live. I see you out there. Those of you out there, Facebook Live, we'll be getting started in just a moment. God bless you. So glad you joined us tonight. We're going to continue our study tonight. I'd like to buy, um, good evening. Hello, good to hear from you. Um, this evening we're going to be looking at seek to finish up this series we've been doing on the marks of excellent ministry. The marks of an excellent minister, should I say. I'm saying ministry because when people hear minister, they tend to think, well, that's to a preacher. So I want to try to get across to us that ministry is not just for the preacher. Ministry is for every believer. Every believer is a minister in some way. Should be a part of uh, not only the grace of God for salvation, but the grace of God for ministry. In some way, uh, service to God. And ought to be our desire to not only serve God, but to serve God with a level, on a level of excellence. And so we've come to the end of the, the book of Romans and this is Paul winding down, but a lot of times these two chapters, 15 and 16, get overlooked because people think, well, Paul's just saying, see you later. But we've seen a whole lot of uh, truths here because we get the heart of Paul. Paul unveils his heart. Paul unveils the work that God has done. It's like going under the, it's like going under the, um, the hood of your car to see what's making it work. And I think we ought to go do a, a underhood check every now and then to make sure our motives are right, doing the right path, because Paul sets an example. While he's talking and ending this letter to the Romans, he's also exposing uh, some things that are going inside of him to make him a strong leader. And so um, we've entitled this section um, Marks of an Excellent Minister because we want to have those same marks in our lives. Amen. We're going to look at what Paul what motivated him and what moved him. We want those same motives working in us because this is Christ working in him. So he, he sets forth a wonderful example of what Christ would have us do. And that's why we're taking time to do these um, marks. I'll name them and we'll um, pick up where we left off in verse 17 on last week. Verse 17, so 15 and 17 of Romans. Father, we are so grateful tonight for this time of study. And we do uh, solicit your spirit to be the real teacher. Just let me be the facilitator that the spirit of God will use me in some way to impart a word of truth to your people tonight. We just give ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to you. We thank you for your many blessings. And be with us in a special way tonight, O oh God. Manifest your teaching uh, power and manifest, O oh God, your healing and deliverance power as we come forth because we know the word of God has a power to heal and to forgive. And we thank you for these things, O oh God. Commit our way to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're dealing now in the marks. And I'll just remind you of the earlier earlier verses in verse. These marks begin in verse 14 where uh, Paul was encouraging. We talked about that. Emphatic or bold, number two. Uh, speak boldly and clearly about uh, the will of God, being willing to say what needs to be said, bold and clear. And then we had equipped. Paul, when God calls you, he also equipped you. Amen. So uh, 
that's a wonderful thing that encourages my heart all the time. Because when God gives you an assignment, he gives you what you need for that assignment. We looked at equip. Then we talked about a little bit of, we talked, um, number four, we talked about uh, excitement. Verse 17 talks about Paul's excitement. Um, and I guess we're there, so we're going to pick up at um, in 17. Paul's excitement here. I, I have, therefore, I have, therefore, aware of, I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. So we talked about this um, on last week somewhat about how this word glory, some of your translations will have even translated this word boast. And so Paul is boasting. And um, it's a strange thing that even this morning I was going through the Psalms. I, I can't remember the exact Psalm I read, but I was going through the Psalms this morning and God was saying who he was. I think it may have been Psalm 50. God was saying who he was. How if he needed anything, he wouldn't ask us for anything. How everything belonged to him. And how great he was. And God was just, God was just saying who he was. And I was thinking all the way to work. These are the things that we're told not to do. God is the only one that has a right to say who he is and what he has is because it's true about him. Uh, because we really don't own anything. We really don't have any power. So our boasting that we have is... The holy boasting is a boast about what God does. We boast about the Lord. And it's okay to boast about the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever, together. So, um, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Uh, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. That's boasting. Boasting about God. Glorying this. When we boast in ourselves, that's the bad boasting. But we boast about God. That's the good boasting. All right. So verse 17, Paul said, I have therefore, wherefore I may glory or boast. How? Through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. So Paul's not boasting about himself. He's boasting about the Lord. I think we need more of that, don't we? We need to boast about what God has done. We're going to see in the, in the end of this uh, verse, I think it's verse 29, Paul talks about the confidence that he has. It's great confidence that God's going to use him to be a blessing. And that kind of spoke to me. I want to, I'll deal with that a little later uh, as we move down to the text. So, um, boasting. So, um, then we come to boasting or excitement. We look at uh, verse 18 and 19 has to do with empowerment. What Christ accomplished through Paul. Uh, it was all about Christ in you. Uh, all about Christ working in him. Verse 18 and 19. For I will, I will dare, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought in me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about um, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So now Paul's going to talk here about um, him being empowered, empowered to do the things he's doing. Because he said that I would not dare speak of any of those things that Christ, what? That Christ have not wrought in me or worked in me. So Paul is saying that it's not him doing the work. It's Christ is doing the work in him. Paul talked about himself in several of his writings. He talked about um, his, his past, his history. How he was a murderer and a persecutor of those who um, believed in Jesus Christ. But he said God's grace is working in him. And God's grace is working in him in a mighty way. And we see that's what he's saying in these verses. That it's, it's, it's not him doing the work. It's God that's empowering him. And God not only empowers Paul. God empowers each one of us. God gives us what we need to do the work he's called us to do. And uh, I find this in my own life. I find this um, very often. It's when we get lost in the need of others. We experience the power of God. When we get lost in the need of others, we experience the power of God. When you seek to help someone, uh, there's no other time that you're closer to God. And when you're reaching out, to help someone in what they're going through. 
And what God does is that he, by his spirit, comes in to, to assist you and to do that work through you. It's an amazing thing that when we seek to uh, put other people's needs above ours, the anointing of God comes in our life and gives us a, something special that we can uh, use, that we're being used of God. And a lot of times, when God is using us, when God is using your life, you are a spectator to what He's doing. Oftentimes, when I'm teaching, preaching, or being used in some way of God, I'm sitting back inside, looking out and seeing God do what He does. Um, it's amazing to be used of God because God takes your body and your mind and your mouth and your lips. And he takes those, the, the faculties that you have, the Holy Spirit is now in us, motivating and, and working through us. The, um, book of Acts talks about how, how God worked special miracles through the hands of Paul. Who was doing the work? God worked special miracles through the hands of Paul. And God is still working miracles, amen, through the hands of his children. Christ is the, 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 the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And we are the hands and the feet. So sometimes when I'm in prayer, and I mentioned this to you before, sometimes I'm in prayer and praying for people, I get this earning in my spirit, well, what can you do to help them? What can you do to help them through their struggle? And so I find myself sometimes being uh, praying for people and then becoming a part of the answer. That's how God works. Amen. Uh, he gives you the burden to pray. And then he says, this is what I want you to do. Amen. When God, you know, when God called Moses, Moses was trying to, before Moses uh, left to run run to the back side of the mountain. He was down there trying to show the Israelites that God had called him and he was uh, and he wound up mur mur murdering an Egyptian and wound up being a runaway uh, from Pharaoh. So when God did call him, he was 80 years old. When God called him and showed him that uh, bush to burn uh, and was not consumed by the fire, God called him there and then God said to him, I'm going to send you to live my people. Then Moses became a person, you know, I'm not, I can't speak. I'm not able to do these things. And that's usually our first response. But God is not asking for you to do it in your strength. God is saying to you, do it and I'll be with you. Amen. Do it and I'll be with you. And God showed himself strong through Moses. Very strong. Showed himself strong through Moses. And uh, Moses had this shepherd's crook. You know, they were used to to uh, bring the lot, the straying shepherds in and correct them and keep them lined up. Had the little uh, hook on the end, the shepherd's crook. He had this shepherd's crook and uh, he told, God told Moses to throw it down and it became a snake. Pick it up again, became a shepherd's crook. But it became, became more powerful when um, they got to the Red Sea. Remember when they got to the Red Sea and Pharaoh was behind them? And, and he's sitting there crying out to God, and God said, lift up that rod. So that rod, after a while, Moses began to call that rod the rod of God. Because God took a simple shepherd's crook, a simple shepherd's crook, and used it with great power. Amen. God, God used that simple shepherd's crook to, to, be a, uh, to open up the Red Sea. So maybe you have a cane. <laughs> Maybe you have something that you look at as being insignificant. God can use that thing that seems insignificant to bring great power. There's a, a young lady, I think I mentioned her before. I mentioned her often because I listen to her every now and then on my way home from work. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tyler, who um, lived right here in Maryland, I believe, had a um, skiing accident as a youngster and became a paraplegic as a result of that um, accident. And she's um, an older woman now. She's got to be around, uh, around a senior by now. Uh, one, I guess up in the 60s or whatever, like myself. Someone around our age or not uh, my age or, or older. And she um, is still a paraplegic. But she um, talked about how God used her wheelchair as a, as a, uh, uh, as a, as a emblem of power. How, how could God get the glory out of a wheelchair, out of a paraplegic? This woman has a worldwide ministry. 
she sings, she speaks, and she has a ministry to those who are paraplegic, letting them know that God has use for their lives. So she finding out that God used her more so through her illness than he would have if she was well. But it came through much soul searching, very much tears, even went to a Catherine Kuhlman um, healing service. Many of you don't know about Catherine Coleman. She was a well-known faith healer back in the day. And she went there waiting to get healed. And um, she saw all these manifestations breaking out all around her. But at the end of the service, they pushed them off on the side and put them in the elevator back and sent them home. And she went home unhealed. And she felt like, God, why don't you heal me? But she didn't realize that God had a greater use for her life. So maybe you're dealing with something that seems like a handicap. You're dealing with something that may seem like... Uh, it, 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 it seems unfair. Why me? I was just finished. My son is going through some things with the illness. I just got finished thinking to myself, why us? Why did he, you know, and I had to say why us because he's the one living through it. Why did our family get hit with a incurable disease? And then I didn't even verbalize it because now I realize that God does these things, allows these things to happen in order to bring out stuff in us that would not have been brought out without it. God has a way of bringing us to the place where he wants us to be. You know, uh, through even the bad things of life. So God may use the simplicity of something that we may think that's a handicap. Something we may think that's a disability. God will use that, you know, for his glory. And that's what I'm trying to say to you. How can he take uh, a person that's an introvert? How can he take a person that would rather not be in the front? A person that would rather not be in charge? A person that would rather not be out in the front speaking and doing things? Why would he choose somebody like me to do what I'm doing? So you got to realize you put your little bit in God's hands and God will use it. So we, none of us have an excuse. Amen. None of us have an excuse. Moses say he couldn't speak well, but God said, who made your mouth? Amen. God knew how you could speak or couldn't speak before he called you, but he still calls you. God wants to take the things that seem foolish, the things that we would overlook and consider nothing. He takes those kind of things and, and confounds the wise with them. And I've got this um, confidence God is working on in my life. That I see him working his confidence in my life. It's not a self-confidence. It's a God confidence. Because, I, you know, in and of myself, no, I can't do anything. In and of myself, I don't have anything. But with God and God working through like he did, he equipped Paul. This ministry was done not by Paul, but this ministry was done through Paul. Amen. God's got a great work. Can you touch yourself tonight and say God's got a great work? God's got a great work for me. Amen. 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 God's got a great work for me to do. God has called you and your work may be behind the scenes. Your, may, your work may be out in front. It doesn't matter because we're all working for the same person. Amen. And we want to hear him say what? Well done. Amen. We want him to say well done. So you're never too young. You're never too old to be used. Amen. And you may retire from your job, and I plan on retiring soon from mine, but I will never retire from God's work. Never will I retire from his work. As long as I can lift my voice and wave my hand. Amen. Whatever I have, I'm going to let God use it. Amen. So we thank God uh, for this today. He equipped Paul. I was in verse, still in verse, um, in verse 18, really. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. Christ working in us. What a privilege. Amen. And Paul said, I only speak about those things that Christ wrought in me. But we got to recognize we it's okay to tell, to say people that this is Christ working in me. It's not boasting in me. It's boasting in the power of God. And what was Paul ministry to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Paul had an effective ministry. He had a ministry that was on point where God was using him to plant churches and make disciples. Amen. He would leave that part. Once the church was planted, disciples were made, he'd leave and go somewhere else and do the same thing. Multiplying, multiplying. And I pray God would make us, each one of us, a kind of a child of God that will multiply, duplicate, uh, speak to people, witness to people, lead people to Christ because the world needs Christ. Y'all know that? 
We're going through a crisis right now. This Ukraine situation is a mess. Putin and all this stuff is a mess going on here. But God's people ought to be really praying because God is speaking through all of these things. Praying for the wisdom of the administration that we have now. Praying that God give wisdom to know what to do to put this man in check. Praying that God would save Putin. That would solve everything. <laughs> if Putin ran into Jesus, <laughs> that would solve everything. Amen. So pray for his salvation. Pray for the families of those who had to leave their homes and those who are hiding in subways and those who are trying to get out of town. Those family members have lost so many people already through the bombs that have gone down. There's a lot to pray for. And we need to spend time in prayer, definitely in time in prayer. And prayer is a battle. I'm telling you guys, prayer is a battle. Um, but when you see God working, you see him working. The young lady who, um, I got news this evening, the young lady who um, was in a coma for 41 days in intensive care ICU, who woke up, now she's on her way to rehab tonight. Y'all give God praise. And I, I just can't remember a time in my life, and she may never even know it. I can't remember a time in my life I prayed so consistently for somebody and so um, adamantly for someone. And thank God for hearing our prayers. Amen. Not only me, it's other people praying, but God heard those prayers and brought her through a mighty, mighty trial. And still, she's in recovery now, still praying for her recovery. But we pray for each other. Take time to pray for people. If you love somebody, pray for them. Amen. Best thing you do. The best thing I can do for anybody is wish them Jesus. That's the best thing I can ever do for anybody. I want Jesus for you. That's what I want. So I want Jesus for Putin. Y'all say Jesus for Putin. Y'all remember pray, pray that, right? That's what I want. Jesus for Putin. I want Jesus to touch this man's heart, to turn around him coming in, taking over people's land, taking over things he thinks is his. I just want God to touch his heart. Amen. Um, nobody's beyond God's reach. All right. So um, he says, oh, obedience, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. It's important, right? It's not just what we talk about. It's what we do, what we practice. So our um, doctrine is what we learn, the words. The doctrine must be translated in our lives to practice what we practice in our deeds. And Lord knows I need help in that area. Amen. It's easy to verbalize another thing to actually do the things. All right. Verse 19, Paul is stating how God worked through him through mighty signs and wonders. God gave Paul the apostolic uh, a gift. It was accompanied by mighty signs and and wonders it wasn't paul's power but he says by the power of the spirit of god this is god's spirit working and i know there's um some great bodies of people who teach and preach that god is no longer working mightily through people that god no longer does miracles god since we have god's word we no longer need miracles no we don't need miracles but god still is a god of miracle working i witnessed miracles i witnessed um uh, miracles in my own life and miracles in the lives of other people where where the touch that God did could not be explained medically. So God still does heal. Although the apostles of, of this day are gone, God's power. P Paul kept saying it wasn't me. It's the power of God. And there's no uh, uh, lack of God's power. There's no change of God's power from early church to our churches today that's changing people's response and yieldedness but no change of god's power god's power is not diminished he says it here through mighty signs and wonders how are these done by the power of the spirit of god the spirit of god is still moving in our midst and can do whatever he wants to do so be careful when you start telling people god doesn't do that anymore who made us that with that wise to tell god what he no longer does. God can do what he want to do and use who he wants to use to do whatever he want to do. Um, I, I, I've gone to great, 
I've heard some great Bible lessons by some men that's much more intelligent than I am who sit there and explain away everything that God God used to do this and God used to. So all we have here is a um, a museum of what God used to do. But I see a book that's talking about a living God. Amen. A God who's not a God of what he used to do. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. From the very beginning, he's a miracle working God. He said, let that be. Amen. Down to the book of Revelation, he's still a miracle working God. When he says, behold, I make all things new. So from Genesis to Revelation, God has always been a miracle working God. And I don't want to limit him. Don't limit God's work in and through your life. Amen. God can take the simplicity. He can take the simplicity. He'll allow you to go through, you know, uh, the awesomeness of God. He'll allow you to go through tests and trials. You don't even understand why. And offer you to come out with a deep appreciation of who God is. And then when you meet people who are going through similar tests, you're able to tell them, let me tell you what God can do. Amen. You're able to tell them what the Lord can do. So it's a very important that we understand that when we're tested, it's not just for us. It's for those who we'll minister to. All right. So Paul is saying this is the same power. I'm letting you know that it's the same power. Uh, mighty signs and wonders. God can still do that. God can still do that if he chooses to. God can still work through men and women if he chooses to. Amen. I don't want him to pass me by. I'm saying uh, you don't do that anymore. I heard, I think I told you guys about this, um, this most powerful testimony I've heard uh, in a long time. Uh, I think I did tell you guys about it about a month or so ago. I would listen to a radio program where a guy had lost his voice. He had some kind of, uh, he got he got a flu, and in the flu, he lost his voice. He was a pastor. He wanted to step, step, stepping down his position because he couldn't speak. He had a real squeaky voice. And the doctor kept saying they couldn't understand why his voice was um, like this. They couldn't, it, it was no way that they could figure out what was going on. They think a virus got in there and wouldn't come out. And so he basically started doing writing instead of preaching. But one day, um, his old church invited him to speak. He said, I can't speak to you guys. You'll get tired of hearing my squeaky voice. They said, we'll put the mic up there as loud as possible. We want you to come and speak. And you can hear it on the tape. When this guy began to talk, he was talking that day. The Sunday school lesson he was teaching, the Sunday school lesson, and it was a pre-assigned lesson. He was talking about God's healing power. And he was explaining how God doesn't heal everybody. He only, but he, but he still does heal. And while he's speaking, his voice comes back. Wow. And you can hear it on a tape. He, and he's so, he's like, uh, 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 I don't know what. And the more he talks, the clearer his voice gets. And since that time, he never had the voice problem again. So while he's teaching about what God does and doesn't do, God healed his voice. And I'm telling you guys, God is a money. He wasn't looking for healing. He wasn't fasting for healing. He had asked God and nothing happened. God just decided to come in at that moment and move. Nobody touched him. Nobody put oil on him. Nobody spoke into his life. God just did it all. Y'all, come on now. God, y'all, give God some praise. God is an awesome God, isn't he? God is an awesome God. So maybe you wonder, you know, you 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 got the doctor's report, but you heard, have you heard God's report? Hallelujah. You got the doctor's report. Have you heard God's report? I'm not saying don't do what the doctor says do. Do what your doctor says do, but pray and recognize. Ask God to give your doctor the wisdom to know what to do for your case. Amen. Give God and always know that God, God may use the doctor. The doctor's in the same business God is in. The doctor trying to get you well and God wants you well. So don't fight against the doctor. I was so dumb one time. I was going to take my glasses off because God doesn't heal me. By his stripes, I'm healed. I was young and dumb. But thank God for eyeglasses and uh, visible bifocals. <laughs> Amen. God is using them to help me see. Amen. Thank God for the knowledge he's given doctors. One time, if you had glaucoma or something, you couldn't get treated, you go blind. But God's got all given men all kind of wisdom. This is still God's work and God's power. People are living longer than ever before. Why? Because God has given man the wisdom. 
to do these kind of things. So I'm thanking God. So whether God heals you directly like he did this man's voice or indirectly, God is still a healer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And every healing, y'all no, listen to me good. Every healing on this side is temporary. Because we're going to leave here. We're going to leave here. One day all of us are going to leave here. But when we see him, everything's going to be permanent. Amen. So don't look for me in heaven with eyeglasses. <laughs> don't look for me in heaven with limping and doing the old man shuffle. All that stuff going to be over, y'all. Outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. Give God praise for that. The Bible says the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Isn't that good news? So that means I'm getting old outside, but the inside I'm getting younger. Oh, give God some praise right there. Inside, inside, my inside, I might can't run, but I can leap. My heart can leap. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. And that's how I feel, y'all. I feel like inside of me, inside of me is getting younger. Although the outside's getting older. Because God is doing renewal. How many of God will renew your strength? He renew your power. He restores your soul. Thank you. Amen. So don't worry, don't, you know, that, because there's, uh, somebody said because there's, uh, what, um, smoke on the chimney don't mean, that means the fire is still burning, amen? How many know there's still a fire burning inside you? You may can't move like you used to move, but it's still a fire inside. Who keeps that fire burning? It's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's not, it's not a made of fire. It's not a performance. It is God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. Aren't you glad about that today? Hallelujah. So that's Okay. You getting old outside, but guess what? The inward man, the one who matters, the man that's going to heaven, yeah. hallelujah. The inward man, you ain't taking this, you're not taking this body to heaven, but the inward man is, is tasting and seeing the Lord is good. The inward man is being refreshed by God's spirit. The inward man is being strengthened by God's spirit, and God is still doing a work through his people. So I don't know about you, but I don't want God, whatever. Somebody had a song a little while ago, Paul Morton, whatever you're doing in the season, hey, please don't do it without me. Let me get in the, move by your power. Amen. God is moving by his spirit. If you get in the wave, you get in the, in the wave where God's spirit is moving, he's going to use you. He's going to use me. That excites me. I guess y'all can see I get excited about that because people talk about God, like God has a limit power. He only, he only uses power to start the church. But don't you know the same gasoline that starts my car, my car still needs to run on that gasoline. So if the church started with the power of the Holy Spirit, the church needs the power of the Holy Spirit right now. Give God a praise right there. Amen. We need that same power. God didn't change the octane. Amen. Hallelujah. God gave us the person of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in me. My, 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 my. So through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, Paul begins to give this, this, uh, his loop of influence, his, his travel information. He says, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto uh, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul is speaking of, that's some 1,700 miles of travel. 1,700 miles, and they had boats and, and shovel legs and animals. Amen? That's how they got around. That's a lot of travel. Paul said he had fully given the gospel. He didn't have step when he came to town. When Paul came to town to give a word, he preached Christ. Christ is the only one that can, his name is the only one that can save. Amen? If you're not preaching Christ, you're not preaching. It's about Jesus Christ. He fully preached the gospel of the good news of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. The church is founded on it. Amen. The church is founded on Christ. The church is built on Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who lives in that building. Amen. You and I form of like bricks and stone, lively stones. We build a house for God. The house of God is not the church building. That's just bricks and mortar. The house of God are the believers. So we come together, there'll be some power. My, 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 my. When we come together, the power is not in the White House. The power is in God's house. 
Amen. It's in the individual believers. So the building is not the church. The people are the church. The church worships in the building. The church shouldn't worship the building. Amen. The church worships in the building. That's why anywhere can be a place of worship. Amen. Fully preached Christ. Uh, verse 20. So we see in verse 19 again, we see uh, Paul giving the, um, what's the word? Um, endurance. Endurance of the ministry. One of the marks. You got to have some endurance. Amen. Don't start the race and not finish. How many times have I tried? I, I told some, I think I said it Sunday morning about me trying to quit. Trying to quit on God. Not quitting the salvation, but quitting ministry. Making my mind up. Making my mind up. You know what? I ain't got to take this. I don't have to be in the pulpit to worship God. I can sit in the, in the pew like everybody else and still worship. Amen. That was my mindset. I don't need this. <laughs> I ain't got to take this. Being undermined and uh, undervalued and mistreated. I ain't got to do all that. I can serve God away from all this. And I tried that for a couple weeks. <laughs> I was like a fish out of water. <laughs> I was in, I was like a fish out of water. I just could not operate like that because that's not what God called me to do. So you go forth and do what God tells you to do. Amen. Amen. Do what God tells you to do. And God will make a place for you. Amen. God will make a place for you to be used for his glory. All right. So Paul says here, amen. In verse 20, Paul says, yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel. This word strive has an idea of a um, ambition. This word strive, it means to be ambitious. And um, we're taught so often that children of God shouldn't be ambitious. And we have to understand that we ought to have, just like we got a holy boast, you ought to have a holy ambition, a striving, not being satisfied, uh, competing. I'm competing, but this competition is not with uh, other people. You're competing against who you were yesterday. I don't want to be the same person I was yesterday. That person of yesterday wasn't strong enough, wasn't wise enough, wasn't used enough. That's how you got to be. That person of yesterday, yeah, he was where he was, but now I'm in another place. That's how you got to be. Having ambition, his ambition was to preach the gospel. His desire was to preach the gospel. And this is what Paul, Paul's attitude, Paul was a pioneer. He says um, in verse 20, so... So I have strived to preach the gospel where? Not where Christ was named, least I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul's call was not to go into a place that already heard about Christ. Paul's call was to go in a place where Christ had not been named and lay the foundation for um, another ministry. Y'all see that? He says, uh, Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. So um, this steps into something that's very interesting and something very important. And that would be mission, missions, and how important missions is. And I haven't, um, um, I guess, um, nailed down how we will do it as a ministry, but I want us to get into uh, missions also because I see that the whole Bible is about missions. From uh, the very beginning, uh, in Genesis, God wanted the facts told. The book of, you think about Genesis, God wanted the nations to understand. And the book of Acts was a missionary book. The four Gospels, it was, they were given the Great Commission. Genesis, the Bible says, all the families of the earth be blessed. The Psalm speaks to uh, the nations. Uh, not only does scripture speak, New Testament, Old Testament speak of mission. God's a missionary God. He wants his word to be heard by all peoples. Jesus is a missionary. The Holy Spirit is a missionary. The apostles were missionary. 
The book of Romans about missionary work. So, uh, this holy ambition we ought to have, this uh, holy ambition should be wanting to reach people with the gospel. Uh, in America, we've, we've got churches on every corner. Yes, there's missions to be done here. And if we never go overseas, we should at least be sponsoring someone or encouraging someone who God has called to go overseas. Amen. Someone who's ministering in areas where the gospel has not yet been preached. That's a that's a tall, bold uh, call to go into lands that are hostile to Christianity. And sometimes Christianity is illegal to preach Christ and to go into underground churches and to places like that with the gospel risking your life. It's so different than what we used to um, dealing with because we have gospels everywhere. We got so much church on every corner and all of them things. Not that we're doing much with them, but we got a lot of churches. Amen. 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 We got a lot of churches, but not, we're not doing much in them. But, you know, but we have a lot of buildings filled with a lot of people, and we just have a holy huddle amongst ourselves. But it's to think a little broader about, you know, reaching people who do not know Christ and um, figuring out what to do in our neighborhoods, what to do um, in our cities, what to do uh, in our market when we talk to people in the marketplace. It ought to be our heart. I'm asking God to give me that kind of heart that I want to, um, wherever I am and whatever I do, that I would want to lift Christ up and to share him with other people. Paul had that kind of, that's a holy ambition. You want ambition? You know, we have ambition to get better jobs, better homes, better all the other things, all those ambitions and all these dreams. How about dreaming some dreams for the Lord? He said, Lord, I want to be ambitious for you. The gospel go forth. Not with someone has preached before, we have this thing, we visit this church, this church visited us, and we preach to the preachers and preach to the choir. No, Paul said, I got to go somewhere where it hasn't been heard. Amen. That was his passion for missions. Go where it hasn't been heard. That the uh, that 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 um, he didn't want to build on someone else's foundation, but he was a foundation builder. Paul would go and lay Christ and make disciples and move to the next place. He's going to talk more about that as we go on. A little further in verse 21. He goes on a quote. Um, I think this passage is, I had it written it down. I think it's Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah. I wrote it down. I think it's Isaiah 52. Uh, I think it's Isaiah 52. He quotes this passage of scripture in Isaiah 52. I'll look at it in a minute. But as uh, verse 21, but as it is written, yes, Isaiah 52 15. To whom he was, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. He goes back to Isaiah, Old Testament writer, to 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 say that um, this is something that um, this is a realization that evangelism has always been a part of God's program. People who haven't heard. Will hear. Those who uh, haven't seen will see. I might take us over there, 53, Isaiah 53, for a moment. Let's look at that for a moment. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Yes. Yes. I'm getting a uh, I want to start reading a little bit further up. That's the last verse to think, right? Yeah. Yes. Um look at verse 13 here. Isaiah 52:13. Behold my servant shall deal prudently. This is speaking of Christ called the servant here. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. 
as many as were a stony at thee, a stone at, at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than, in the, than the sons of men. All right. I want to take us there to let us see that um, this was a cost for salvation. And I'll come back to the verse in a minute. So shall he sp sprinkle many nations. See many nations there? So it wasn't just the Jews who we blessed. Israelite was many nations we blessed. Uh, the king shall shut their mouths at him. He's on quiet kings. We want, we want uh, Putin's mouth shut. <laughs> for uh, that which he had not been told, for that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall consider. That's going into areas that had not heard the good news. Amen. Those who had not heard. And those who had not heard will hear and do what? Consider. That's a step in it. When you tell people sometimes about Christ, they'll look at you like, uh, you know, I don't know. But that's that's the seed that's planted. But I want us to look at verse 14 again because it's describing. Uh, verse 13 tells us about the servant. That means this it's a servant. This is Jesus Christ speaking of him. He's going to deal wisely. He shall be exalted and it's and stole very high. But then it has a place where, that's a place where he's elevated and exalted. But here's a place here that talks about him being um, uh, not elevated but lowered and through uh, mistreatment. So the same one here that's been exalted high is also, this verse 14 tells us that something happened to him. Uh, Many as were so a stone, a stone at thee, has the idea of being um, um, shot, uh, a shock value. His visage was so much, his visage is his face, the way he appeared. His visage or his face was so marred more than any man. The brutalities, this is, not, this is what he's saying. The brutalities, the brutalities that this servant will go through was that he was so, uh, mistreated that he didn't look like a man he didn't look he look like a man was telling us that christ was beaten so badly that he was just a lump of flesh didn't even look human i know we see these pictures where his faces you know these pictures that on tv but uh the picture was was and here's isaiah seeing this hundreds of years before it happened so we see his exaltation in verse 13 then we see his demise in verse 14. And then we see the result of it. What's the result of this servant going through such a terrible situation where he no longer look like a man? So shall he sprinkle many nations. Sprinkling has the idea of cleansing. All right. He's going to clean. The king shall shut their mouths. Those who are up high are not going to have any authority towards him. At him. Why? For that which had not been told of them, they shall see. And that which they and that which they had not heard shall be con they consider. The gospel going forth. And it continues. Isaiah 53 talks about this servant coming. Most people know about it. Who has believed our report? It goes on to say that. I encourage you to read these um servant psalms. I think it goes down to verse chapter 50. Um Probably 55. I think it's 55. Maybe 54, 55. These servant psalms talk about what the servant shall do. But I'm taking you back now to where Paul left us out in Romans. All right. Go back to Romans. He's quoting that verse, letting us know that the realization here, this is a, a point of excellence. When we, re, we come to the realization that uh, evangelism and missions is a part of a mark of excellence in ministry. Reaching out beyond people who look like us, who speak like us, who of our, of our culture, reaching out to them to let them know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. They might not believe you, but it's not your, it's not you to convince them. They might not understand you. It's not for you to give them understanding. It's for you to give them the truth and let them deal with it. Amen. Plant the seed. 
Do what you can. Just tell them the truth. They may even laugh at you. But plant the seed. We're in a, we're in a uh, world of day, y'all, that the stuff that I'm talking to you about now is this is strange talk here. Because there's no absolute truth. You got, you got a, we in a, a day that uh, genders do not matter. They tell them people don't say one woman's arguing and she, we should no longer use he and her. It should be them and name the teacher. Not, not, no, there's no genders. No more gender. Don't say he and she. This kind of world we live in, it's a crazy world. It's a crazy world. But let them go crazy. Keep your sanity. Stay close to God's word. Amen. 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 Um, so I was in verse 21. Yes. Verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. What cause Paul speaking of? We talked about it earlier. Paul has a missionary uh, mindset. In his missionary mindset, the gospel had gone forth. He wanted to come to Rome. But he says, not right now. Because he was still doing ministry at other places. Going places. Rome had gotten the gospel. But he's going to other places. He, his, he's missionary and ministry minded. That he's going to keep doing what he's doing. And he can work his way back to visit Rome. He's going to tell us that. He says, for which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. He wanted to come, but he couldn't come. His apostle wanted to come. He wanted to talk face to face with the Romans. He wanted to impart to them. He's going to let us know that he wanted to impart to them uh, spiritual insight. He wanted to be strengthened by them, but he says not now. So this man wasn't guided by what he wanted to do. He was by, guided by what God wanted him to do. He says, which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. Who was hindering him? His mission and passion and God himself was saying not yet. That's a hard thing to hear. It's a hard thing to hear not yet. How many of you hear not yet about stuff? It's a hard thing to hear. Because we generally want things now or we want it yesterday. But to have God say not yet is hard. But you have to sometimes think you. you have to sometimes do what's necessary above what you want to do. So Paul says he's not yet. He wanted to come Rome, but he couldn't. He says, verse 23, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire, um, having a great desire these many years to come to you. He's been in the areas of Rome and uh, ministering in the colonies of Rome and preaching the gospel. We read some seven, 16, 1,700 miles of ministry around this area, but he hadn't come there yet. And, um, but he would come to him. He's letting him know what he's going to do. His route he's taking. He says, whensoever I take my journey into Spain. So he's going, Spain is beyond Rome. He said, I'm going to come and stop by you on the way to Spain. I'm not staying because the gospel hadn't gone to Spain yet. On my way to Spain, I'll stop by and see you. That's his plan. All right. I will come to you for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought by you on my way a hither toward by you. If uh, first I be somewhat filled, um, somewhat filled with your company. All right. So he's saying here, I'm going to stop to see you on my way to Spain. And I'm, I, I, he says that he, I want, he's, I trust, um, to see you my journey and be brought on my way by you. So he's saying, I'm going to need your support. That's what he's saying to him. I'm going to need your help. I'm going to Spain, but I need you to help me get what I need. You know, finances, whatever, food, whatever you need it. I'm going to need your help. He's, I brought on my way, brought on my way by you. Doesn't mean I'm coming by you, say hello and sing you. No, it means he needs some, he's going to need some things to go in Spain with. I'm going to stop by and see you and be brought on my way by you. If um, first I be somewhat filled with your journey, she said, I'm going to stay and spend some time with you, but I'm moving on from there. All right. Uh, I'm going to read one more verse and we'll come back. Start at 26 next week. All right. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So Paul had an agenda. We'll talk about this next week a little bit. Verse 25, Paul had an agenda. Paul had been collecting monies for Jerusalem. Um, he was writing this book 
from Corinth um, at the end of his third missionary journey. He's writing this book of Romans. And he had been there, and they had taken collection up for the saints that had gone through famine and so forth in Jerusalem, the poor saints. And they had taken up saints, and they had trusted Paul to take that money. So Paul is going to do something that seems real crazy. He's going to backtrack because Jerusalem's behind him. And then he's going to come back. He was closer to Rome, going in the direction of Rome. He would hit Rome, then Spain. He's going back because he has to drop this. He wants to drop this money off personally. And we'll talk more about that on next week. So Paul had to walk in the will of God. His um, his purpose, not only was he um, involved in uh, missionary work, he also was involved in giving and leading giving parties out to. We'll see how the church of Corinth gave, even though they were they didn't have, but they still gave. We'll talk about this in next week. All right, so we'll pick it up here, verse 25, Lord willing, on next week. All right, God bless you. We're going to have our closing prayer soon. Uh, in a few moments, just remind you that um, the, all of these Bible studies, I think it's wonderful. You, you're able to go, you will go to our YouTube channel. You can, if you're behind in any study, you go back and look at any lesson, any sermons that we do, we post them soon after we do them on YouTube. So you have access to all these studies over and over again. Look at them as much as you please to study along with us over and over again. And on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we have a Sunday school lesson. At 11 o'clock, we also uh, have our Sunday morning service at 11 o'clock, all on Facebook Live. So come and be a part of our services, and please, please pray for us as we are uh, minded, uh, getting back in our mind that COVID is, the numbers are going down, thank the Lord, uh, looking for a place we can meet uh, together in a place that we can come out and meet together physically. So I thank God for each one of you. Amen. Please keep us in prayer as we seek to do the will of the Lord. Seek to do his will. We just a bunch of foolish people wanting to work for a great God. Amen. That's all. That's summing it up real good. Summing it up. So let me have a word of prayer with you as we close tonight. Amen. Father, we're grateful tonight for your blessings and mercies. And we pray tonight, God, you give us the heart of missions. Make us mission minded because this is a mark of, uh, of a person of excellence, a mark of ministry. To be willing to reach out to areas we have never reached before to do what we've never done before in order to spread the cause of Christ. Please give us that kind of heart. Forgive us for our many sins against you by thought, word, and deed. And I pray tonight, God, that someone coming by this live um, video or looking at these videos late, these social media later will come to know you as a result, be strengthened by you as a result of coming this way. We give ourselves to you, God, for service. Have your way into our lives. We thank you for each one listening tonight and those who shall listen. They may receive a blessing. Save someone, God. Heal somebody. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God for you, my brothers and sisters. I love you in the Lord. Amen. God bless you. we see you next time. Kingdom Praise Ministry is signing out. Ladies.